This is Cuba. This picturesque nation between the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean is home to possibly the most bizarre economy in the world. Its wild swings between a hardcore capitalist society to a workers paradise and now an odd combination of both has meant that the country has probably not been able to live up to its full potential, which is quite disappointing. On paper the country is in quite a good position. It has a very well educated workforce, huge reserves of oil, and a climate that is extremely conducive to tourism and agriculture. But despite all of these advantages, Cuba is yet another example that goes to show that national prosperity relies on a lot more than just winning a natural resource lottery. Cuba and its citizens are poor, but they can't even do that normally. The average working citizen of Cuba earns about 25 US dollars per month, but yet the country still maintains a relatively high quality of life amongst the developing world. So what is going on here? Is Cuba really the ideal communist system that so many countries were trying to create in the last century? Or is it a country just desperately trying to make a flawed system work? At the beginning of the 20th century, Cuba was a very different nation than what it is today. It was a land of freewheeling capitalism with possibly a more liberal market than even the United States. Cuba had claimed its independence from the Spanish and they were keen to run their own show, fully aware of their place in the world. With the help of the United States, the nation built up industrialized agriculture and focused on sugar production, which was becoming an increasingly popular export back to the United States at this time. The nation was also an extremely popular tourist destination. It had beautiful beaches and a great climate, sure, but perhaps more importantly, Havana was a place where Americans could come to gamble before well-established cities like Las Vegas and Atlantic City existed within the United States. The country had a very liberal stance on gambling because of the tourist dollars it brought in, and the USA kind of liked it as well because it allowed American companies to profit off an industry that was still heavily frowned upon at this time in the United States. But therein started some of the problems. Sure, the country was becoming wealthier and wealthier on paper, but very little of that was going to the hard-working Cuban citizen, and this wasn't just good old-fashioned run-of-the-mill inequality either. The big problem was that Americans owned everything. The reason that America contributed so heavily to Cuba's development by building all of this infrastructure was because it was America who would profit from it. American companies sold this idea to the Cuban government as a great way to develop infrastructure which would in turn create fantastic jobs for the citizens of the country. Which is a sales line that should probably sound pretty familiar to everybody today. But anyway, what this meant was that all of those hotels and casinos and horse tracks, they were American owned. American companies also owned almost all of the arable farmland and sugar refining factories. Over 90% of that sugar was exported back to American companies to America, where the profits were retained by Americans. Sure, there were jobs produced, but they were not good and did not pay well. The problem got all that much worse when oil production started to take off in the region. Foreign companies like Texaco, BP and Shell swooped in claiming oil fields and generating huge profits. Again, all for the hope that some of this money would start to make its way down to the people of Cuba, which it didn't. Cuba had effectively shrugged off Spanish colonialism for corporate colonialism. The country basically existed to serve the corporate interest of the United States at this time, and America didn't even need to stick a flag in it or, you know, defend it. Pretty good deal for the Americans. But as with all good things, it did come to an end. In 1959, after years of a long and bloody revolutionary war, the Cuban Communist Party rose to power, fueled by the will of the people to make sure that the wealth of the country was being returned to the people of the country, rather than international corporations and their puppet dictators. Sounds fair enough. And you know what? For the most part, it probably was. Cuba was a repressed nation at this time, and here was their chance to determine their own prosperity. So they started off that journey the same way every other great country starts out, by nationalizing their telecommunications industry, and their farmland, and their oil refineries. 
By the 1960s, basically every major industry in the country was under the control of the central government, with the plan that this would finally mean that the people of the nation would benefit from the wealth that they were creating. But perhaps it was a bit of an idealistic plan. The initial problem was that nationalising all of these mostly American-owned infrastructure projects was kind of telling the American government to piss off. Which again, you know what, was probably entirely fair, but... But whether they liked it or not, Cuba was still almost solely reliant on trade with the United States. Either way, mere days after the nationalising efforts of the Cuban revolutionaries, President Eisenhower blocked all imports of sugar, effectively severing the international lifeline of the country. The USA also saw this as an effective way to kind of suffocate the communist economy, theorising that if Cuba couldn't trade with the United States or US allies, they might rethink the whole workers' paradise thing. Fortunately for Cuba, this whole communism business was pretty popular with the Soviet Union, and Cuba was a perfect ally for the Soviets to hold on to. You see, the USSR had to deal with NATO countries like Turkey and Norway that were basically on their doorstep, while America was safe and secure on the other side of the world. Having a strong ally in Cuba, right there off the coast of Florida, was a great way to return that kind of pressure Moscow was facing at this time. So it didn't really make sense economically for the Soviet Union to trade with Cuba. They were just too far away and for the most part they didn't really need anything that Cuba produced, but it did make sense for them geopolitically. So now Russia threw a lot of resources at making Cuba a successful little communist outpost. So Russia bought up Cuba's sugar and in return they provided the country with refined petroleum and infrastructure and nuclear missiles and machinery. And oh, I guess one of those things is not like the other. Any good faith that was left between Cuba and the United States at this time was completely smashed by the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was the closest 13 days humanity has ever come to the apocalypse. Well, at least until April 2020. We'll see. Fortunately, the world didn't end. But any trade to, from, and between Cuba was effectively tied, and the only people left for them to trade with was the Soviet Union. Now we have seen time and time again that international trade is one of the key determinants of prosperity in a developing country, and unfortunately for Cuba and its people, that was severely limited under these new restrictions. And it all became worse when its one and only friend in the whole wide world ceased to exist. In 1991, the USSR disbanded and Cuba lost its ally that it relied on so heavily to effectively prop up its struggling economy. In the period between 1989 and 1992, the GDP of Cuba dropped by over 35%. And that's based on very generous figures released by the Cuban Communist Party. So yeah, the situation was not good at all. What made this all worse is that even if Cuba could rekindle some of those old friendships and start trading again, the price of sugar had plummeted around this time as more and more countries started using corn syrup instead of cane sugar. So it was not a great time for them to be moving out on their own. Unfortunately, throughout the 1990s, Cuba followed a very similar path to that of North Korea, another country that was cut off from foreign aid when the USSR crumbled away. There was widespread unemployment and starvation, an increasingly strong military presence, and a reliance on debt to keep their head above water. But how they differed was the way that they reacted to this adversity. North Korea basically hunkered down and gave the big middle finger to the outside world, only occasionally popping out to beg for foreign aid. But Cuba kind of admitted defeat in a sense and tried to turn everything around. They opened themselves up to tourism, they started allowing foreign investment, they liberated people to start their own businesses, and perhaps most bizarrely of all, they legalized US currency. This was almost a complete 180. Foreign investment was the thing that caused Cuba to effectively be an American colony just 50 years earlier. Private businesses with private profit was certainly not on the communist menu, and using the US dollar to trade in Cuba was like a vegan expo using beef jerky as legal tender. But it all kind of worked. Things with America were still a bit weird, but tourists from other countries started flocking in. Originally it was just out of morbid curiosity, in the same way that people go and visit North Korea today, 
But slowly it started expanding into real genuine tourism, with people just wanting to enjoy what the country had to offer at a pretty affordable price. And it all started to get better as well when they found their new major trade partner, Venezuela, which at the time was one of the last bastions of socialism in the modern world. So those two got along quite well. I mean, long term it probably wasn't the greatest of friendships, just watch the video on Venezuela to learn why, but you know what, Cuba had to make the most of the friends that it did have. So yeah, during the special period, things weren't great by any means, there was still a lot of poverty and food was scarce, but things were improving, and potentially for the first time in the country's history, they were the masters of their own destiny. They weren't relying on Spain or the United States or the Soviet Union, they were their own agent to make their own fortunes. But as markets became liberalised, some of the problems started to leak back in. There is an old joke that economists make about Cuba in the modern day. It goes something along the lines of that there was a young Cuban man trying to win the favour of a lovely young Cuban lady. In an attempt to impress her, he brags about being a doorman at the Ritz-Carlton in Havana. This works well, but unfortunately the relationship falls apart when the young lady realises that he's actually just a neurosurgeon. Now this sounds absurd, but in reality it's true. Doctors in Cuba are part of the national healthcare system, which is entirely controlled by the government. Because of this, they get a state-sanctioned salary on top of the standard social welfare enjoyed by all members of the nation. The salary probably amounts to about $30 a month. Now, in Cuba, the government can get away with paying doctors so little because the state does genuinely provide for almost all the needs of a family, but it does mean that there is very little career differentiation between a street sweeper and a neurosurgeon. The people that do do well though are those that have access to tourist dollars. It wouldn't be unusual for a tourist to tip a doorman $30 and then, hey bingo, that one tip has equaled the salary of a Cuban doctor. Because US dollars are legal tender in Cuba now, it means that people operating their own businesses or working in tourist facing industries are significantly better off than a majority of the workers in the nation that still work for the government. Now normally, this causes something called brain drain. If I was a neurosurgeon in Cuba, I would do everything I could to get to the US or Canada or Europe because my quality of life is going to be significantly better if I can practice medicine over there. This would mean that the country would slowly lose their best and brightest citizens and the economy would struggle because of it. It happens in many, many other countries around the world. Weirdly enough though, it hasn't been a major issue in Cuba. Partially this is to do with access to information. It still must be remembered that Cuba, for all of the colourful buildings and beautiful beaches, is an authoritarian state. And there are harsh penalties for people wanting to go against the interest of the government. But another thing is that the education system is set up in such a way to teach socialist ideologies alongside a regular curriculum. Cuba has one of the best education systems in the developing world, and those neurosurgeons would have gone throughout training just as intense as they would have in the United States. But during their 20 odd years of schooling, they would have been learning to seize the means of production alongside mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell. So it all just went to reinforce that the more educated you become, the more devout you became. Which is of course morally questionable, but has meant that Cuba is holding on to the people that make the nation tick. Cuba and its economy are just really, really strange. It's kind of been impacted by every major geopolitical influence in modern history. From colonialism to corporatism, the Cold War, and now it's entered a period of economic development. But it's still trying to make an outdated idea work, and it's ultimately stopping them from taking full advantage of the blessings that they have been afforded as a nation. But it's certainly not all bad. Despite all of this adversity, self-inflicted or otherwise, the nation has been able to maintain a quality of life for its citizens. But it may not be able to do much more than that into the future. What that future holds, who knows. But the nation is getting richer, and fortunately, as people get richer, they get more aware of improvements that can be made to benefit themselves and their communities, and they have the means to enact on those improvements. But 
it's a slow and painful process. And until the country goes through it, it will remain the only place on Earth where a doorman is richer than a doctor. Hi guys, thanks for watching. If you did enjoy the video, please consider liking and subscribing and or supporting the channel over on Patreon like these lovely people did. Otherwise, I will leave a link in our video description for our Discord server, so feel free to jump onto that to participate in our Q&A session and also enjoy the discussion amongst other economics nerds like myself. Thanks guys, bye.